Happy New Year and welcome back to campus. Today we will go over some course mechanics as well as introductory material for data analytics. Project number one is out. It will be due in a week, Tuesday, the 26th of January at 11.59 and 59 seconds p.m. Make sure you are following instructions in project number one handout. And you should also make sure that you're starting right away. So the world around us is full, increasingly, of lots and lots of data. We have all sorts of sources for data. Take, for example, the smartwatch. Smartwatches now with, say, the Apple Watch, they can measure uh, your oxygen saturation, uh, your heart rate, your pulse, etc. And so this thing works continuously for some of those sensory modalities, resulting in a fair amount of data. Uh, typical smart house coming online, you have lots of things like smoke detectors, uh, water level detectors, and things like that in homes increasingly. And these produce lots and lots of data. There are research projects underway to embed materials for construction with all sorts of elements that measure things like stress, strain, corrosion. And so if you marry that with a sensor, now you can continuously sense the condition of public infrastructure like highways and bridges and deploy roadway crews when you need to proactively saving money as well as extending the lifespan for these pieces of public infrastructure. Smart meters. I remember many years ago in Delaware, the conversion happened to smart meters, and smart meters are two-way. They send back information to the power company about usage of electricity. And the idea with these smart meters is that you can control them effectively, ratcheting down the amount of power someone can consume in order to prevent brownouts when usage is at peak levels, for example, in the summer when a lot of people are turning on the air conditioners. Now this figure is pretty interesting. Uh, that's a smart vest and imagine something you wear uh, that is embedded with sensors that can give continuous monitoring measurements uh, for things like heart condition. So imagine then somebody has had heart surgery or you're recovering uh, from heart surgery, maybe someone had a heart attack or what have you. Uh, now you can do that monitoring and perhaps beam that information with some analytics over to a physician to see how someone is doing continuously and perhaps notify them if something is starting to go off a little bit. So you can be more proactive. So all of this leads to a lot of data. You name it, there are many, many more sensors being deployed across all sorts of application domains, resulting in a lot of data. And so we're swimming in lots of data in this deluge. What do you do with all this data? How do you make sense of this data? Well, one of the first things you do is that you're gonna look at the data, you're gonna examine it. You're gonna to try to figure out what are the important parts of the data to attend to and what are the parts that aren't so important. And so you then take this data and the idea is then you can perhaps build some models or some measurements that operate over this data. And at the end of the day, it takes only those salient pieces of data, the information, that are useful for making some kind of decision. And so in this particular case, it's a classification model. Perhaps you want to separate image data into categories of images of dogs versus images of cats, and you want to do this in automated fashion. Now, of course, to do that, we need to study the data. How do you represent the data? How do you acquire the data? How do you move the data? How do you store the data? And then the models how do you process the data? What sort of operations do you perform? And then how do you take your output so that you can visualize it, talk about it, make sense of it, communicate it? So that's the main topic of this course. Let's take a look at our course outline. Now our gain, our goals rather, are many fold, four fold in this slide, to gain mastery with a key topic, analytics. And Understanding and dealing with data is unavoidable these days, regardless of the industry or organization that you're in. Now, this course is going to introduce methods, approaches, and tools for something called inference. 
And that's going to be a really important word as the semester goes on. This idea that you can derive conclusions based on what is known given some amount of data input. So this is going to be data-driven arrival upon conclusions. Now, of course, the tools we're going to use for those models are going to be drawn from statistics. You can consider statistics as uh, the relative of probability. Probability, we talk about the models responsible for producing data. Statistics, we take existing data, derive some measurements from it, and use those measurements to make a statement generally from a particular subset of data. And if we can do this, quote unquote, correctly, or in the right way, then the result of what we find from those pieces of information buried within the data will apply to all of the data regardless of what parts of the data you're talking about. And so we're going to look at concepts, methodology, theory, and ultimately uh, go towards building prototypes to allow you to perform inferences uh, from data. And so the tools we'll employ are going to be the same ones from last semester, uh, but we're going to cover the second part or second half of the book, Probability and Statistics for Computer Scientists. And this will be the third edition, not the second edition, wrong picture. Uh, the third edition, the same book that we used last semester. And we will also reuse MATLAB, the site license, as the tool for building models. And so there are many other useful resources swirling around the web. Uh, please avail yourself of them if you need refresher. And there are many other great explanations of things uh, where the book falls short. So these are the assessment pieces. Uh, we're going to have four project assignments worth six and a quarter percent each, total of 25%. Three written homework assignments worth 8.33% each for a total of 25% of the grade. Two written exams, one and two, worth 12 and a half points each for a total of 25% of the grade. Then we're going to have a research project. The report and code is 15%. The slides and presentation is 5%. Your class participation is going to be 5%, and everything's going to be on a fixed grading scale depicted. So what will we cover? Well, we'll look at what's the point, look at concepts, terminology, and application. We'll segue to visualization and data. How do you talk about data? How do you depict data? What types of data are there? And how do you describe what the data is telling you? We'll talk about descriptive statistics. Sampling and sampling distributions and confidence intervals. We'll look at hypothesis testing, and we'll throw in some machine learning types of things, regression and predictive analysis. We'll look at classification and clustering specifically. So we'll add some machine learning types of things, namely the classification and clustering, because the ability uh, to make statements over data or from data is going to requ require you to use some particular types of tools that are very, very useful. And so we'll touch upon some machine learning types of analyses. So time. Lecture begins promptly at 9.30. Please get here before the class begins. At the published time is when class starts, not when you get here. I respect your time, and I will always let you out on time. Now, I agree that sometimes people are late, but please make sure to come on time. My rule is simple, get here on time or don't get here at all. I reserve the right not to let you in class if you are late, so please know that ahead of time. Uh, assignments, I do not accept late assignments, so please make sure when an assignment is posted that you look at it right away. Plan your time accordingly. And yes, I understand that real life situations will occur, Please provide documentation if that is the case. How to succeed. It's about engagement. Use Slack discussion on uh, forum, and I've put a link to the Slack channel for the course, uh, CSCI-350, uh, on the Blackboard. Spend time every single day. Don't be a hero. I don't need Superman. Be Clark Kent and just do your job. So it's the day-to-day -day work that you need to invest in this class to engender success. So top reasons why people don't pass my course, not following instructions. There are too many of you between this class and my other classes uh, to wade through all sorts of things that people do. It slows down the grading tremendously. Uh, and I've made some exceptions in the past this semester. 
I'm not going to make those exceptions. And so I will deduct points if you are sloppy. If I say to put everything in a zip file called first name, last name, dot zip, I mean a zip file, not a tar, not a rar, not a seven zip, I mean a zip file. If I say to put your work in a folder with your first name and last name as the name of the folder, I mean put it in a folder and produce a zip of that folder. Whenever you stray from that, you are taking time, and this time I'm just going to give you a zero and just move on. I'm not going to spend time addressing uh, lack of following instructions. Likewise, a single document for written work, either PDF, or Microsoft Word file. You're using uh, Pages, uh, or if you're using Star Office or Open Office, do a file save as MS Word or PDF. I don't want to see anything else but those two formats and a single document. So don't hand in six JPEG files expecting me uh, to interpret your homework. Put them all in a single document and save it in one of those two formats. Otherwise, I will not read it. It gets a zero. Provide full answers. You have to explain how you arrived upon your answer. Don't just put the answer. That's not sufficient for this class. And people don't attend class, so you miss things that are covered in class. If you did not attend the class, and then you have a question about it later, I'm going to say go ahead and watch the recording of the class. Um, you can't attend the class. I'm not going to invest the time if you're not willing to invest the time. Make sure you're reading regularly. The page count can creep up, and the course is designed for you to do a little bit every day. Do not miss homework assignments. Suppose you missed one homework and one project. What does that mean? So it means you get a zero uh, for 6.25% for uh, a homework for project and 8.33% for homework. So that means if you miss a homework and a project, it means that for 14.58% of your grade, you got a zero. So what does this mean? It's devastating to your grade. It means then the max grade that you can get is 85.42%, which is a straight B. And you only get that straight B. And you only get that straight B provided you get 100% on everything else. So if you can't get 100% on everything else, just by missing two pieces of work, it's very unlikely you're going to be successful and not pass the class. So please make sure you strive to get your homework in on time. Do not wait until the last minute to hand in your work. Do not wait until the last minute to start your work. Last minute means waiting two days before something is due before you start doing it. The first day it's out, you should be downloading the homework, looking at it, thinking about it, and enterprising to work on it. Do a little bit every single day. So policies, arrive on time. Posted office hours do not require an appointment. I have the office hours on the syllabus. If you cannot make those office hours, please schedule, with an emphasis on schedule, office hours outside of those posted blocks of time. You do not need to set an appointment for the office hours that are posted on the syllabus. Now, help me to help you. When you come to office hours or if you have a question on Slack or what have you, provide context for the question that you're answering. I have many other courses I'm teaching, interacting with many other students, and it helps me to help you best if you provide context. Late work will not be accepted. Make sure to mute your microphone when you're not participating in a discussion. It's distracting and you take away from everyone else's education. Now this last one, do not cheat. It's painfully obvious when you cheat. I don't enjoy it, you won't enjoy it, don't put me in the situation of flunking you and taking up action against you. I absolutely have no qualms doing it, nothing personal, do not cheat. So what exactly is data analytics? Well, it's a science, and you examine data, and the whole purpose of those examinations is in order to draw conclusions about the information contained within it. So you're not going to use all the pieces of data, you're going to use some of those pieces. And those pieces that you use are the subject of certain analyses or functions or statistics that you compute and run over that data. And so data analytics has broad application in all sorts of industries, and it allows them to arrive upon better decisions. So this is all in support of decision, maker, decision making. 
as well as either proving, disproving, or verifying certain theories and models, assumptions that you might have about how some system operates. And of course, you're going to do so by gathering data or samples from that system. So data mining is kind of ancillary related. It focuses on models and approaches for identification and discovery of your patterns and relationships. But data analytics, our focus is going to be on inference, namely how you derive a conclusion based on what is known. And that what is known part is particularly important. So let's begin. Now, sometimes you sit there and look off to the horizon and contemplate life's mysteries. And this is a picture of uh, Lewis off the coast of Lewis in Delaware. Who's better, Michael Jordan, MJ, or LeBron James? Well, all of you are relatively young, probably say LeBron James, but I tend to think Michael Jordan is far better. But this begins the question of what better means. Well, if you look at what Michael Jordan can do, well, Michael Jordan can fly. I would dare say Michael Jordan could jump and fly higher than LeBron James, but LeBron James could absolutely fly. So in the inset, we have Michael Jordan on the upper left and LeBron James on the lower right. Now, LeBron James has won a fair amount of awards. Well, good for him. But Michael Jordan has won far more awards than LeBron James. But the point is, and this is what we're trying to get to, what does better even mean? Because they both have changed the game. They both have been very integral and influential, both for their team as well as across the sport. And they both have been international ambassadors for the sport, as well as assets to the local communities uh, where they played and where they live. So this begets the natural question, what exactly does better mean? Okay, well, does it mean more points? You could call better more points who scored more points. Um, number of slam dunks. Maybe the individual awards, maybe the three-point shots that they've made. The college awards, maybe it's the better defense, how many steals or how many blocked shots. Or maybe it's the number of sponsorships and endorsements. There are lots of ways that you can measure this idea of better. And so what we require then is a good definition of how you measure this idea of better. So statistics is the thing that provides a tool for making quick comparisons. And it would take a really long time if you were to list out all of the work that somebody has done. So suppose you took a video of every single minute and second of LeBron's body of work, every game that he's played, right? So here's a game. And there's a shot. There's a three-point shot. And you could also certainly take the entire body of work, the written account, every video for every minute of every game that Michael Jordan played. And you'd have lots of things like this. There's a three-point shot. And Jordan was known for his hang time. So you could absolutely do that. And that would represent several thousands of hours of video. It would be painstakingly hard to make a comparison, answer those questions, if you will, based on the entire body of work of both of the players. So instead of looking at the entire body of work, all this video, you collapse all of this complex information into a single number. And that single number is what you call a statistic. Now you might be asking, how exactly do they do this? Well, if you look at a game and pay attention to the people on the sidelines, there's a game, a game desk. And this game desk has, among other people, folks who sit down and for various players, they collect the game data. So they're constantly watching for certain types of things. The number of free throws, the number of shots attempted, the number of shots made, 
the number of steals, the number of blocked shots, and so forth. And so some of the people at the game desk collect game data, and it's this game data that's used and summarized to give you a statistic that you can try to use or use and employ as the basis of determining what it is you're trying to determine, i.e., who's better. And so this is Kevin Beerham, who was a graduate, uh, 2017, and this is a great example of someone uh, who combined his passion uh, for sports uh, with his vocation. And not long after he graduated, he got a job as a statistics auditor uh, for the NBA. Now, these are two of our alums who not that long ago, Carla, was sitting in your seat just in 2019, uh, 2019 graduate BSU. She is an alum of the class. Uh, and Kevin, of course, he's now working for the Brooklyn uh, Nets. He's a business analytics person. And Carla, uh, she's a data scientist at Booz Allen Hamilton. So she does data analytics for a living, data science, they call it. So, you know, you do your work, uh, you learn the material, and you do well for yourself, and in a year or two, I can add your name here among the alumni. And this is just a small sampling of the many people who've directly uh, gained employment as a result of, in practice, many of the things uh, that we talk about in this class. And so this idea of better, statistics helps you do a number of things. It helps you process data as well as answer interesting questions and important questions. And so we're going to think of data as this raw material of knowledge. And so you have all of this data floating around, and you want to take out those essential portions of the data, which you will use in order to answer some question. So we start out with our data, and that's our raw ingredient. We input it into this funnel, this processing. We're going to call our statistics or analytics. And we're going to output this refined version we're going to call our information. And we're going to use this to make a decision, and that's going to be our inference. And use that inference, you're going to arrive upon a decision. Okay, so data is the raw material of knowledge, and the statistics is what helps you condense it down in order to concisely describe it and draw comparisons. Comparisons such as what we alluded to before, who's better, MJ or LeBron? So let's continue. Sports certainly is a nice motivating story, and it can be quite lucrative, say, through entertainment revenue or legal gambling. There are all sorts of other examples. Let's consider an example called the Gini Index. Now, the Gini Index is a measure of statistical dispersion, if you will, and it's used in economics to measure this idea of economic disparity. How evenly spread out is all of the money within a society or a country or some municipal entity? And so countries, or more correctly, the people within them, they have wealth. And the three primary ways people build wealth is through employment. You exchange your labor for compensation, okay, uh, through inheritance. And inheritance is, in the United States, the single largest way that people, average people in general, build wealth. And if you think about it, uh, those monies, those resources, have had more than one lifetime over which to accumulate and grow in value. And then we also have investments. And so your investments, your money is pooled, and it's committed to some purpose, and that purpose succeeds, and they pay back your money uh, with interest in the form of your investment returns. And so this person, Robert Smith, if you didn't know who he is, he's the uh, billionaire. He's one of the wealthiest uh, people in the United States, or among the wealthiest. And he famously, in 2019, as the commencement speaker uh, in Morehouse, paid off the entire student loans for the entire graduating class of 2019 at Morehouse College. And so these three ways people build wealth is employment, inheritance, and investments. And so when you build wealth, what the Gini Index looks at is how spread out this wealth is among the individuals in the population. And this Gini Index ranges in a range from zero to one. 
Now, on the low end, and this is important when you describe a statistic, the Gini index at the zero side of its range uh, refers to identical wealth in all households. That means for every single person in that society, so you can imagine the United States, everybody in the United States would have the same amount of money, would re represent a Gini index of zero. Taken on the flip side, the converse, the upper side or bound of the Gini index statistic uh, corresponds to a full concentration of all the wealth within a single household. So that would mean of all the people in the United States, there's one family or one household who has all of the money in the United States. So in the case of a Gini index of zero, regardless of what you do or don't do, everyone makes the same money or has the same wealth and gets the same returns on investment and gets the same inheritance. For a Gini index of one, that means you work for the same family, regardless of where you work, regardless of you know, where you live, you're going to be buying your house from one family uh, in the United States owns all the houses, owns everything. And so the extremes are never good. If the Gini index swings towards zero, economists say that there's no incentive to contribute or grow and the economy collapses. You might decide to start uh, a business and your business uh, gains a lot of customers, let's say a million customers, and you're selling a lot of your product whether it's an app or a device or what have you. And it doesn't matter how much you sell or how little you sell, everyone gets the same money. And that really wouldn't work because it would disincentivize people to take the risks and to work hard, and the economy and society would collapse. On the flip side, if the Gini index swings towards one, well, that means you're going to have one family owning everything. And that's going to lead to unrest, total chaos, and you have a societal collapse. You're going to get a lot of uprisings and stuff because people don't like being controlled by one small group. And so I looked it up, and here's the Gini index uh, as of, I think it was 2015, uh, for a number of different countries. And so Sweden, their Gini index is closer to zero. They have a lot more social protections in place. Uh, Canada is 0.32. China is 0.42. Uh, Brazil is 0.5, near the middle. South Africa is closer to 1, uh, 0.65. United States in 2015 is 0.408. Now, when you look at the United States from the years 2015 to 2020, the Gini index for the U.S. changed from 0.4 to 0.48. And so one of the things you could do is say, okay, well, what happened in that time frame? Uh, we were recovering from a recession and then COVID-19 hit, and it would be interesting to see the new Gini coefficient for 2021 when it comes out, which reflects what happened in 2020. So when you report for 2020, that's not all of 2020. Okay, and so this Gini index, it's computed regularly, and you might wonder why should I care? Well, it's used among other things to make policy decisions about things such as social services, municipal spending. So is your city, town, or state going to invest more money in job training programs or in scholarship programs uh, so that people go to school or go to college and get other types of training? Uh, is it going to uh, put forth programs, uh, grants and loans to help people uh, buy their first home, for example? Are they going to forgive student debt, for example? And so this Gini index is computed regularly and statistics such as these are used uh, by municipal entities and governments to decide where they're going to spend monies and also to make policy decisions. And so these decisions impact many millions of people. And so here we have a statistic, the Gini index, that really does impact real life. And so it bore out when we look at what happened during 2020 uh, with the coronavirus, uh, women bore the brunt of the job losses uh, for coronavirus. And a proverb says, if you improve the status of a woman, you also improve the status of society. And so this article from May, 20, May 9th in 2020 talks about how women bore the brunt of the coronavirus job losses. Uh, and in particular, women of color um, uh, suffered and impacted particularly badly uh, during uh, COVID-19, at least during 2020. And so if you're a policymaker, of course, if you looked at the Gini index, you might divide your population up into various demographics 
uh, and then decide where you're going to spend your policy dollars in order to rectify the situation and improve the economy. Now, of course, uh, women had it badly, more badly uh, for COVID-19 in terms of all the associated economic devastation. Uh, during the Great Recession, 20, 2008 to 2009, uh, it was the men uh, who suffered uh, the most. Uh, oftentimes, it's called the man session uh, because uh, industries that were predominantly are dominated by males uh, were those industries that collapsed, like the construction industry. And so there are all sorts of different types of statistics that do all kinds of things. And we'll list out some of them uh, in high-level categories, so-called descriptive statistics. These are numbers that summarize or describe the data. Uh, inf inference, inferential statistics, these are types of statistics that are conclusions that are reached on the basis of evidence and reasoning from your data. Uh, risk assessment, uh, the analysis of things that can go wrong, and the identification of relationships, the examination of cause and effect, the linkages uh, between different systems based on their data. And so let's take a look at the first one, descriptive statistics. When you're trying to pose a concise summary or descriptive statistic, you have to make sure you're careful uh, when you're considering what you're trying to measure. By your very nature, if you're forming statistic, you're forming a summary. And in forming a summary, you are essentially throwing away data. Now, of course, what's left should reasonably depict what you're trying to illustrate about the data. You can use a single data source or you can aggregate together multiple data sources. For example, if you're looking at football, you could look at pass completions and interceptions together. Uh, for example, in the game of baseball, a batting average is the percentage of times you're at bat for which you hit the ball, okay? Um, in school, a grade point average is the weighted average grade that you get, and it's a measurement of how well you're doing or how well you've done in all of your classes. But hiding within these summaries, the batting average doesn't describe how difficult the pitches were that you received. So maybe you received a lot of curveballs and sliders, which are harder pitches to hit than a slow ball and a fastball. And so when you look at this batting average statistic, you also need to look at which pitchers the person has faced and what types of pitches this person has seen or received. The grade point average, it doesn't describe the course difficulty. So suppose uh, you were uh, computing your GPA uh, for the gen ed types of courses, uh, your GPA may be higher. Uh, maybe your GPA is a little bit lower when you started taking uh, more of the discipline specific, specific courses, like say you're taking algorithms or you're taking you know, calculus two or three or what have you. Um, this doesn't depict how difficult your courses were, it's just an average. And so when you look at a descriptive statistic, you want to also ask the question, how was this data obtained? And what does this data mean? Because you also need to understand that there's certain pieces of information in these summaries that are thrown away or discarded. So let's take a look at inferential statistics. Now, of course, for certain types of problems, it's difficult to go out and get all of the data that you need. So for example, let's say you want to conduct a survey. And this is going to be a survey about the homeless population. And let's not even think about in the US or even the state of Delaware, let's just think of the homeless population in Dover. Now, Dover, Delaware has a population of 38,000 people. It's not a large city by any definition of uh, size. So even for something as small as Dover, it's really expensive and I dare say logistically impossible to find every single homeless person in even a small city, a small town, such as Dover, Delaware, population 38,000. Now, of course, are they out there? Absolutely. But I promise you, in order to find all of them, you'd have to send out caseworkers all across the corners of the city. Now, they're not going to be in the same places. Some days of the week, maybe, you know, they might be near Dover Library. Other times, they might be near Legislative Hall. Other times, they might be near some restaurants or so forth, the police uh, station. So they move around, and you're not going to find all of them. So what is the solution? 
Well, you can use data to make informed questions or informed conjectures about larger questions for which you don't have full information. So you have the known world. When you make your inference, the hope is, is that you're going to make a statement that applies well to things that you don't know. Now, the known world are those pieces of information that you actually can obtain. So let's take a look at this. How do you do this? You do this by sampling. So for, when you sample, what you're doing is gathering data for a small area across different categories that's representative of the larger group you're trying to make a statement about. And you're going to use these samples to make informed judgment about the original population. So let's carry this example with the homeless population. So let's assume this is the homeless population of Dover, and you're going to make some assumptions based on maybe you've studied the homeless population, you've talked to a couple people, and let's say some segment of the homeless population are veterans, homeless veterans. It shouldn't happen, but it does. So you identify uh, that group, the homeless veterans, you select an individual, and you set them aside. Then maybe there's another group, the homeless families, and it shouldn't happen. There are families that are homeless. So you identify homeless family members, and you set them aside and ask him or her or them questions. So then maybe it's those who are drug addicted. There are many homeless who are drug addicted. Drug addiction is a cause of homelessness. Uh, so you take the population of drug addicted, you identify an individual, and you set him or her aside. And then let's say this last subgroup within the population of homeless in Dover are those foster children who aged out of the foster care system. Consequently, once you turn 18, you are an emancipated minor, you're considered an adult, and you're no longer in the foster care system, but you're still a kid. And oftentimes, sadly, uh, such individuals end up on the streets, they end up homeless. So you identify the group of aged out foster children, you find some person, and you set them aside. So now you have these samples drawn from the veterans, the families, the drug addicted homeless, and the aged out foster children. So then you take your representatives that you've identified, and assuming your sample is representative, meaning it depicts the categorization that truly describes the structure of the larger population, you're going to measure something. Now, in the case of homeless studies, that could be a survey, send out caseworkers. And so one of the things you might ask, you might ask, what's the average age of people? Um, if for the veterans, families, drug addicted, and foster kids. Um, what is the length of homelessness? How long have they been homeless? Um, what is the health status? Are they struggling with any health issues? What are those health issues? Are they medicated? Are they managing those health issues? What's the level of education or training? Now, of course, when you get the answers to these things, uh, you might use the results of your measurements at, for decision-making. And so for average age, maybe there's a family issue, and you pour in resources to locate supportive kin. Uh, for length of homelessness, maybe if they've been homeless relatively recently, um, you find a housing solution right, to get them off the streets and back on their feet to be able to maybe enter the workforce. Uh, health status, and then you pour resources direct into directing medical services. Maybe it's mental health services or drug treatment. Level of education, maybe it's skills training, job training, and job placement program. Uh, so the idea then from this summary, this average, average age, average level of hom uh, homelessness, average health status, average level of education, you can now use these summaries to deploy resources in order to address the problem. So some of the questions associated with this, do you have enough samples from each category? Because without enough representatives from each of these subpopulations, it's not going to be a very good representative of what's actually happening in Dover's homeless population. Are your categories appropriate? Now, I made a simplifying assumption. Here are these categories that are non-overlapping. Can you have a drug-addicted veteran? Absolutely. Now, of course, I just explained them as non-overlapping for the sake of making it simpler, but absolutely you could have overlapping uh, attributes. And so the 
question then is, are you measuring useful attributes? Are you depicting them appropriately? Uh, are things like average age and length of homelessness, are those the right questions to ask? Are you measuring the appropriate things? And so this idea of performing inference, if you do it the wrong way, well, the policies that you craft are not going to be very successful. If you do it the right way, ask the right questions, have the right assumptions, well, you're going to be very representative of what's happening um, in Dover's homeless population, and the policies are going to be more effective. Okay. And so sampling allows us to use fewer resources. So if we have these caseworkers, instead of sending out 100 caseworkers throughout the city every day for four or five months to find every homeless person, maybe you're sending out five caseworkers moving around to various locations where the homeless are known to congregate, taking samples, making a representative depiction of the homeless population. And so what sampling does is it allows us to use fewer resources uh, but it also introduces a number of issues. And so when you do your sampling design, you have to carefully consider how you're doing the samples, where you're placing the samples, how many samples you're making or taking, and what assumptions are reasonable for the population under study that you're considering. And so a famous organization, the Gallup organization, uh, they're popular for doing lots of surveys. Uh, Gallup poll, you probably hear that, that term a lot. They determined that if you survey a thousand households, that produces the same result as every household. But this is not a hard and fast rule because if you don't sample the right way, for example, your, your, your survey is only on cell phone, well, you're going to miss an entire group of people who use landlines. Now, you might think, gosh, well, doesn't everyone use landline? Well, people who are relatively young, 18 to 25, they use cell phones primarily, but there are a lot of people who are in different age groups and different demographics uh, who might not use cell phones. Uh, maybe someone is very rural and they're not using a cell phone as much as a landline, for example. Okay, so let's take a look at risk assessment. Now, I love this commercial, and this is uh, Mayhem, and it talks about bad things happening. So sometimes in everyday life, bad outcomes can happen. You can get storm damage, you can trip and fall, break a bone, twist an ankle, and so forth. But some outcomes that can happen are based on chance. Maybe you're driving, what's the likelihood that you're going to get into an accident? God forbid. Now, you can try to eliminate bad things from happening or risks, but sometimes you can't eliminate the risk. So what do you do when you're driving? Well, you wear a seatbelt because that minimizes uh, serious injury should you get into a fender bender. Okay, uh, well, maybe you have safe driving practices and take a driver's education course because that minimizes the risk of getting into an accident. You drive the speed limit, right? You drive safely because uh, that minimizes the risk of serious accident. So you can try to do everything to eliminate bad things from happening, but sometimes they can't be eliminated. So what do you do? You resort to trying to protect bad things through other means. And what do I mean by that? Well, you can use tools from statistics to try to assess how often or likelihood bad things are going to happen. And based on this, you can do something to try to get enough protection against those bad things, such as paying money to have it rectified. So if your car gets damaged, you associate money with the amount of damage that can happen to your car. God forbid, if you get injured, you can associate money uh, with the cost of medical care in order to make you whole again. And so, of course, you pay more if bad things are more likely because they're more likely to happen often. And so the whole, the whole industry or a whole industry is based on this idea of the assessment and evaluation of these likelihoods of bad things happening, i.e. risk. The insurance industry is based upon it. There's homeowner's insurance, right? Money to fix your house should a tree fall in your house or some bad thing happen to your house and you incur damage. Uh, there's car insurance, automobile insurance, that will pay uh, for the repairing of your car or the loss of your car. There's life insurance. Uh, if, God forbid, someone 
uh, passes away, well, this life insurance uh, pays money because you need to replace the income that that person provided for a family, for example, or the people that depended on him or her. Uh, in securities or stock trading and stock portfolio, there's something called hedging. Uh, there are two types of things called uh, calls and puts, uh, and these are rights to buy or rights to sell securities at a certain price. And what this does is it associates risk with a stock, and you pay money for it, and it expires after a certain amount. So if that quote-unquote bad thing happens, you exercise it, and you get back money, and that reduces the loss that you would have occurred had you not had that insurance. And so what they do with risk evaluation, the strategy is to evaluate the variability of a stochastic process describing that item of interest. You examine the likelihood of that bad event, and you look at trends associated with that bad event. So then you estimate a dollar value associated with the bad event, and you pay a fraction of that loss associated with the dollar value of that bad event. And so the fraction that you pay, that's your premium for your insurance. That's why, for example, for automobile insurance, uh, young men between the age of 18 and 25 pay the most expensive insurance premium because statistically speaking, young men between age 18 and 25, sorry guys, uh, get into more accidents. And so your premium is that fraction of the loss that you pay up front uh, should a bad thing happen. And your premium gets lower and lower and lower as you enter different age groups, because as you get more experience and have different age groups, you're less likely uh, to have accidents in automobiles. So there are other things, for example, if you are a firefighter, um, well, there are certain professions where they are disqualified from getting life insurance because the nature of your job as a firefighter is to run into a burning building. That's very, very dangerous. And so oftentimes when you see people who are firefighters, uh, they get their life insurance through their professional union because they're not covered by insurance companies because you could pass just by doing your job every day, right? So people like firefighters, they're in a very high risk group and most insurance companies won't cover them, which is why they often self-insure uh, through their professional organization or their unions. So let's take a look at identifying relationships. Now, in our complex world, sometimes there are certain processes that are interdependent with one another. And this particular schematic talks about uh, cacao. Now, cacao is the plant from which chocolate is derived. And it's a multi-step process that starts with the raw material in the beginning and ends with chocolate that you might see in a store, like a candy bar or a chocolate bar, for example. And so you start out with growing the cacao plant. Uh, you, you harvest the cacao fruit, uh, you take out the, the, the cacao seeds and fruit from the fruit, uh, and then you put this uh, cacao seeds uh, out to ferment and dry. So once you do that, you then um, sell them to an aggregator, these fermented cacao uh, beans uh, on the open market. They pack them and they transport them somewhere where they're roasted and ground. Now, of course, when they're roasted and ground, uh, they start to become chocolate, but they're not quite yet chocolate. So once they're roasted and ground, they're typically put into a paste or formed into a log, and they're processed. Now, that processing might add other things to it, uh, like milk, like butter, like other things, uh, and they make different types of chocolates from that. Now, once you get your chocolate, then you form it into a bar or put it inside of some item, and that's then the chocolate that you know and love. Now, certainly along the way, there are various things that can affect the price of chocolate, the candy bar or chocolate bar that one might enjoy. Let's say you make a number of measurements. You have rainfall. Now, of course, when you're growing, the amount of rainfall you have is going to impact your harvest, which impacts the number of beans or uh, fruits, cacao fruit that you ferment, which impacts the amount that you have, which impacts how much you roast and grind, which impacts the amount of chocolate. So if you have too little rainfall, you're not going to have a productive cacao harvesting season, which means it's going to be more scarce, which means at the other end, the price goes up. 
let's say the labor rate changes. Now, this is very labor intensive, the farming. So you have to pay people to actually grow the cacao. You have to pay people to harvest. You have to pay people to ferment and dry. You have to pay people to pack it. You have to pay and ship it. Uh, you also have to pay people to roast it, pay process, as well as to make the chocolate. So the labor rate affects, ultimately, the cost of chocolate at the end. The cost of oil is going to affect. Now, in this transport, it takes vehicles to transport the stuff in airplanes. So if oil goes up, the cost of transport increases, and that's going to influence the cost of chocolate. And then consumer taste. If consumers decide that they want dark chocolate versus milk chocolate, chocolate with nuts versus chocolate without nuts, it's going to change the perceived value of that product, and that's going to be reflected in the price. And so you have all of these relationships between things in the supply chain. So, for example, you might want to say, what is the relationship between rainfall and labor rate? If the rainfall is such that you have a less abundant crop, too little rain, the crop is less abundant. Too much rain, the crop is less abundant. So if the rainfall is such that you have a more scarce harvest, uh, not a, small, a more small harvest, you're not going to want to employ many people. And so you have more people available to work than you have jobs. So the cost of labor is actually going to go down. But if you have an abundant crop and there's more crop than you have people, well, you need people to pick this thing, given the demand for chocolate, which is insatiable, um, then there's going to be more crop than there is people. So to, you're going to have a higher labor rate because people are going to be working more in order to harvest this. And so there are all sorts of relationships. And in this complex chain called the supply chain, you look at all of the steps in processing both the intermediate as well as the raw and the output uh, involved with a particular product. And so for the supply chain, the evaluation or the measurement of the relationships between various measurements at each stage along the way is very, very important. And in fact, you can make a career in supply chain management just evaluating the relationships between various aspects of a large multi-hop chain type of process. So this idea of asking a question, sometimes the answer is not so straightforward. So in essence, you become a statistical detective trying to connect pieces of data. Now, of course, for the example of the supply chain going from cacao to chocolate, I've given this to you because people understand what that supply chain is, but there might be other measurements that have some relationship that you might not know ahead of time. So then you become a type of statistical detective, like on the crime shows. You know, when they have that big pegboard, uh, like on crime scene investigators, and they say this person is related to that person because of a certain thing. Essentially, what you're doing is using statistics to look at the relationship the strength of relationship between different pieces of data you might be measuring from various stages in a complex system. And there are many, many tools that exist to measure this idea of relatedness. One of them you covered in stochastic computing, namely correlation, but there are many other measures. Now, of course, once you have all of these tools, there are still some questions, some important questions that you need to answer. What is it you will measure? What relationships are you trying to evaluate? They might be one hop relationships, might be two hops, all sorts of relationships. What statistical tools are most appropriate? So there's still some questions you need to answer, um, even if it's something as simple as correlation, which we learned last semester. So here's an example. One question is, does smoking cause cancer? Now, of course, you can't go out and run an experiment and start giving groups of people cigarettes men, women, and children, uh, and measure the effect on their cancer status. That's unethical. But you can select different measurements. In this case, the system is one where you can't control the amount of smoking that people do. But you can select different measurements, and you can decide what things you can vary by going out and finding subjects with certain attributes, i.e. subjects who differ by their smoking habit. So maybe you find a young person who's already smoking but smokes a little bit, a young person who's smoking smokes a medium amount, a young person who's smoking that smokes a lot. And do the same thing for somebody who is middle-aged and somebody who's much older, right? And these are called your control groups. And so you mimic almost like you're sampling, 
but you're not going out and giving people cigarettes. You're finding people who already smoke, but just finding people who smoke in different amounts and tracking what happens to them over time. And so you can consider all sorts of factors that might influence this idea of the cancer status, things like amount of exercise, the family history, lifestyle, etc. And so there are tools such as regression analysis, which we'll cover this semester, uh, that you can use to examine the linear relationship between two measurement types. Now, correlation does this, but linear regression does it in a little bit different way. Now, of course, when we talked about linear relationship and, and correlation, we talked about a unit step increase in one measurement leading to a certain unit step increase in another. So we'll kind of carry this forward with regression uh, and use an alternate way of computing these linear relationships or dependencies. And so it's all important then at the end of the day to ask the question, are your results meaningful? I.e., what is the statistical significance? So for example, let's say you had a population of one and you said um, the amount of smoking increased cancer by 100%, but it was only one person. Well, of course, if it doubled, because there's one person, it doubled, that's not very meaningful. It's not very significant. So you want to also consider if your result is meaningful, but is it also significant statistically? And we'll talk about a framework for assessing that. Okay, so with that, that's all I had. Uh, and again, project number one is out. It is due in one week. Uh, Tuesday, the 26th of January. Uh, welcome back uh, to DSU. Some of you are on campus. Some of you are at home. Nonetheless, please stay healthy, uh, stay safe, 